What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Collider Interview Studio at TIFF 2024 at the Cinema Center, brought to you by Range Rover Sport. So happy to be sitting with Ed Burns talking about Miller's in Marriage. Congratulations on your latest. Thank you very much. Very excited to be here. So I have seen it. I know what it's about. But because it's a festival premiere, our audience will likely be learning about it through TIFF. So would you mind doing the honors and giving a brief synopsis? Uh, Yeah, it's a look at uh, three married couples who are all in their 50s. They happen to be related. Um... Juliana Margulies, Gretchen Mole, and myself play siblings, the Millers. And uh, we find ourselves in our mid-50s as empty nesters. Uh, our respective marriages now are going through some uh, uh, some changes and some reevaluations and some big decisions have to be made about what do you want the next chapter of your life to look like. So I always love hearing about how stories evolve along the way. So what would you say is the big, biggest difference between draft one of this screenplay and what everyone will see in the final cut of the film? Uh, that's a good question. I think um, originally it, it centered around uh, three sister-in-laws. So oh. the character that I play, uh, it was, um, um, I'm trying to think, I guess it's a while ago. So I guess that would have been uh, Morena's character would have been sort of the third sister. Uh, and then at some point I changed and I can't really remember why, you know. I find that stuff so interesting, just like alt universe versions of a story or one of my biggest fantasies is just seeing a cast return to a film they already made, but having them all swap roles and oh, seeing how the idea. narrative yeah, changes. Yeah, 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 that would be interesting. I feel like that would be especially yeah. rich with the ensemble you have in this one too. Yeah. Digging into some of the characters now, of all of the characters you wrote, which were you most enthusiastic about exploring? But then I also want to know which one wound up being more creatively fulfilling to dig into and flesh out than you ever could have imagined at the start. Interesting. You know, so like there, one of the themes uh, explore in the film, and it's a lot of, you know, based on sort of conversations I've had with my friends who are in the business and in the arts as we hit our mid 50s is, you know, um, you know, what, what do you do uh, when you're at this place uh, if your career has plateaued or you're finding yourself with nothing left to say? Or if you do have something to say, does anybody care? You know, can you get your novel published? Will a gallery show your art? You know, uh, can you get your film financed? Like my peer group, well, a lot of us are all wrestling with those questions. So. There are three characters that are all dealing with a version of that that quite honestly, at some point in my life, I've had to deal with. Um, so the one that though, um, I guess the, 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 the one that hit closest uh, to home, um, it's interesting. I was going to say Campbell Scott's character, but I've never really suffer, suffered with writer's block. Maybe the character that I play, you know, even though I play a, a, a contemporary artist, you know, there is that moment where um, he's just wondering, you know, can, can he still find an audience, right? That's one of the deals. He can, he's no longer getting his his work shown in a gallery. Um, and I think for any filmmaker, that is the great fear. Will the audience still show up? A little bit of a tangent, but because I was just talking about this with someone else recently. So you mentioned you don't suffer from writer's block. Yep. I am curious, have you ever encountered actor's block with a scene? You know, a time where you just kind of like couldn't crack it and then maybe tell me how you wound up finding a way in? Uh, you know, it's interesting, a funny thing in actors, we'll talk about this all the time. Sometimes it's the sort of the nickel dime, the small scene that you have where you have one line that you just, you, you just kind of can't crack it because you're focused so much on that. Uh, I know on Private Ryan, I had a scene like that where it's like a long one and everyone had a little piece to do and it kind of ends up on me with the last line mm -hmm. and I effed it up a number of times. So um, yeah, you know, like acting is a weird thing. Sometimes you, you can get in your head about it and um, I think the way you, you uh, I think you asked like, how do you how do you work your way yeah. through it? You just kind of get to get out of your head sometimes, you know? It's like one of the things that I can't compute about how you all do that craft. Because yeah, yeah. like I'll say one question and I'll get in my head halfway through the question. I'll be like, yeah, you're, yeah, saying, yeah. you're saying that really well, don't F it up. And then all of a sudden <laughs> you'll F it up. Um, so you have, you have an epic ensemble here and so many rich characters to offer them. When you were casting this, which character was the easiest to find the perfect fit for? Where like the right actor came to mind immediately, but then I also want the opposite as well. Someone who, you know, took a little legwork or thinking to really find the right match for. 
It's a toss up between Gretchen Moll and Juliana Margulies because both of them read the script early on. And, uh, you know, it's almost like we didn't, uh, I can't remember exactly if we made an offer or we heard from their representatives, but um, there was such enthusiasm right out of the gate for their respective characters. And I think, you know, I know um, uh, Juliana was talking about like, you can't underestimate the desire for actors to play real people with real shit going on in their characters' lives. You know, so um, that I think is why, you know, we were able to put together this ensemble because especially, you know, uh, when we were younger in our 20s and 30s, you know, you're getting to play the lead. You know, as you as you age, you then become a character who is there for one purpose, to move the plot forward, right? To help the hero achieve their goals or to get in the way of the hero's goals. Um, you know, uh, this film, I think it offered all of us an opportunity uh, to sink your teeth into real people going through real situations and those, um, you know, that those uh, the, the, the enormous tininess of real life, right? The little tiny things that we're all wrestling with. I think that's what um, they gravitated towards. Because of that draw to the film, is there anyone who kind of popped up with interest in joining the ensemble that might have surprised you? Someone you hadn't thought about, but then wanted to jump in? I think Patrick Wilson, um, uh, you know, uh, I had worked with Patrick before, friends with him. Uh, I send him the script saying, hey, there's a couple of parts available. You know, would you ever consider this? Because again, they're, you know, it's an ensemble. So you're, it's not huge parts. And um, I was uh, I was kind of surprised about the character that, that he wanted to play. You know, because he's the he's the angry drunk, you know, the and it stressed me out way more than I thought it yeah, would to yeah, see yeah. him play mean like that. Yeah. And he said, I've never done that before. I really want to. And I think that goes back to the thing we were talking about before. The, the opportunity to, to you know, uh, deal with real people in real relationships. And the opportunity to play, too. I mean, one yeah. of the things that I love about your work is, and we'll get into this a little later, but that you go the micro budget yeah. route and that gives you maximum creativity. Yeah. And that is then more satisfying for me as a viewer in the end. Um, going into directing your actors now. First, w one thing that I'm totally obsessed with in terms of acting and approaching your craft is that there are a million routes to take. There are a million different techniques. Every technique is the right technique as long as it is your technique. Yep. Can you tell me two actors in this ensemble who have like polar opposite approaches to the work where it calls for something different from you as an actor's director? That's a good question. Um, oh, that's... Uh, okay. I would say, you know, Ben Bratt, uh, is an actor who probably, uh, likes to talk through, uh, the scenes beforehand. And, um, and as does Patrick, actually, Patrick is more like after every take kind of wants to explore, like he'll find something in the take and then he'll say like, Oh, Hey, I kind of, uh, I did something a little there. I kind of dig what was happening. Would you be okay if we explored that a little bit more? Um, uh, so that that was fun for me. Uh, and again, I'd worked with Patrick before, so I kind of knew he kind of likes that. It was, um, and then the other, then I would say, you know, uh, Juliana is uh, is like such a professional. I mean, she's so good. Like she comes in, she has some questions. I would say before we start shooting that, you know, she and I kind of talked through about who the character is and what, where we thought she was going. But um, that was an amazing thing to just like watch her on the monitor and just see the subtle little choices she makes from take to take. Um, so like this was like, I mean, uh, I haven't gotten to work with like an ensemble like this. I don't know, you know, I've been very fortunate to work with some great actors, but like this was like an all-star lineup. So like it made my job very easy. And there were a lot of times where I was just sort of sitting back, kind of just enjoying watching the scene unfold, you know, and Campbell Scott too. I mean, like Campbell and Juliana together, that, that's interesting because they came up with some stuff that I, I don't know that I saw in the screenplay. So, uh, and, and, you know, we talked about like, you know, I, you're going to know that character better than I know them, right? Because like, I'm worrying about everything else during the course of the making of the film. You know, the color of the couch, color of the walls. Um, can we make the day? 
they, once you hand them the script and the character is theirs, that's the only thing the actor is focused on. So I always encourage and love when the actors come to me like, hey, I, I don't, you know, like I, I think my character is a little bit more this than, than you had thought in the early days when we first met. So um, to get yeah. a little more specific with that, can you tell me something about your own screenplay that wound up becoming more powerful than you ever realized it was based on what one of them brought out of it? Uh, I would say uh, probably t t two. Uh, Benjamin Bratt brought a vulnerability to that character that I didn't see in the screenplay. I mean, I think originally I, uh, I kind of was thinking this was just kind of a guy who, um, you know, uh, was a little, uh, had some bitterness and some anger and that his career never happened. Um, and he brought such a, like a sadness to some of those scenes that was really touching that I, again, I didn't, didn't anticipate. And I think um, Juliana's character, like, the idea that she was like a little icier uh, than I think, um, you know, that, than I originally thought. And we talked about it, like, I can't remember, we discussed it with her, but um, Mary Tyler Moore's character in Ordinary People, you know, like something with it, for whatever reason, she's just a little closed off. And there's a couple of moments with her and Gretchen where, uh, we played with it and I was like, okay, let's, let's kind of lean into that a little bit more that you, you are not available for emotional comfort. So Ooh, it's very powerful yeah. in the film too. I wanted to go back to your approach to directing actors, like more broadly throughout yeah. your career. Cause I always get really excited when I get to talk to an actor who also directs. Can you tell me something that a director did for you in the past that you appreciated and now bring to your actors? But then I also want to know something that you had wished more directors gave to their actors that now you incorporate on your own sets. I bet it's kind of the same thing, you know, um, I made three movies before I got to act in Saving Private Ryan. And I think as a young kid coming out of film school, I thought the director needed to be directing the actors. So I probably did a little too much of after calling cut on every take, talking to the actors, giving them some notes, suggestions, things like that. On Private Ryan, I'd say we worked for about a, a week before Stephen gave any of us any notes. He would do about two takes and say, okay, that's great, moving on. And we were all convinced that we were gonna get fired because he must hate us because why isn't he giving us any, uh, any notes? Finally, I forget the scene we were doing, but uh, he asked for a third take and a fourth take and a fifth, and we ended up doing like nine takes. So at lunch, you know, we went to him and said, hey, what, what happened today? You know, why did you today kind of give us some feedback? And he goes, well, because today you didn't know what the hell you were doing. And then he went on to explain, he's like, look, I cast you guys for a reason. Uh, I assume you're gonna show up to work prepared. I'm gonna assume that you've given a lot of thought to who your characters are. And I don't wanna get in your way, um, especially with young actors, you know, like one little note can get you start thinking about, oh my God, you know, what, you know, any of the insecurities that all of us actors have. Um, and that kind of changed my approach moving forward. I sort of, I give everyone about three takes before I chime in with anything, you know, especially with an ensemble piece when you're doing a scene with, with five or six actors, you know, people warm up at a, a different pace, right? So I figure before getting into somebody's head, give them three opportunities to explore, to play, to find it. Um, so that's what I do now. And a lot of times, you know, it's like really some of my notes can just be, can we go a little faster? Can we slow down? Can you, you know, a little louder, a little softer, maybe that would be some of the, you know, with, with a cast like this, quite honestly, very little direct. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me yeah. to hear that. Wanted to move into the, the micro budget okay. aspect of this film because I mean, micro budget movies is a big part of the reason why I love coming to festivals yeah. and discovering the things that don't maybe have large backing behind them. Cause I don't know, I find that to be some of the most creatively fulfilling experiences for me as a viewer. Yeah. You've been doing this for a very long time. The industry has changed considerably, especially in recent years. So do you find the state of Hollywood now, I guess, like more or less accepting of the micro budget filmmaking format? And do you think there's more more or less possibilities for them after they're made now? Hmm. 
I don't know. So, the, you know, so I've, I've made, as you know, like a number of micro yes. budget movies. This one, we, you know, we had six million, so not so micro, but by Hollywood standards, yeah. you know, a very with low, low, low budget. high certain numbers are ballooning yeah, yeah. nowadays. Even for a, you know, a contemporary drama like this, right? Um, uh, so, uh, I don't really know, you know, like the, the, uh, the business has never been easy. You know, when you make films like this, uh, I've never had an easy go of it um, getting any of the films financed. So that's why, you know, sometimes luckily, you know, like, you know, we've, we've had films where we thought it was a $15 million budget. It went down to six and we made it for six. We had other ones where we thought it was 15 and we've had to go down to 150,000 and do with a completely unknown cast and a two man crew. Um, so the business has always been tricky and then, you know, it's always been hard to get your film sold and it's, uh, you know, and it's always been hard, to, uh, to find an audience. I think today that's the hardest part is finding an audience just because there are so many options. People just don't go to the theater the way they used to. They, we don't have as many art house theaters or specialty houses like we used to. Um, so that part is tough. Now, granted, there are more options available for streaming and, and things like that. But because there are so many options available, I know a lot of films just get lost to slip between the cracks. So it's um it's tough. That give and take consistently stresses me yeah. out because yep. I want I want more options and I want more opportunity opportunities for the artists that I love. But then I also know that that means less will ultimately make an impression in the end. Yeah. And so weird give and take. So now touching on your approach to making a lower budget film, can you tell me something about your approach to maximizing those resources that has stayed the same since the beginning, but then also something new that Miller's and Marriage demanded huh, okay uh so you know we uh always used to come up with like a you know our our lists of compromises right so um you know we used to say like if we're gonna make a film with any kind of real budget all right someone's gonna cut us a check um, we're now in a partnership with those folks who cut the check, whether it's a studio or, or whatever. So with that partnership means there are going to be certain compromises you have to make. They're going to have a say in the casting, in the title, in the script, et cetera. So are you, are you comfortable with those compromises? You know, the micro budget compromises are a little different. Uh, you know, you can cast whoever you want. Uh, you're not going to get any notes on the script. Um, you can use whatever kind of music you want, but you also have to know you're not going to get the bigger stars. And without the bigger stars, there's a chance your movie won't get sold or seen by as many people. So depending on the screenplay you have, you have to decide what compromises are you willing to make? You know, is this a story that, you know, the script is and, and your vision of who you see in it is so locked that you cannot have a partner? Then you go micro budget. You know, uh, if you feel like it's a story you need to tell that needs to reach a bigger audience, um, you know, then then you have to go in knowing uh, I'm in a partnership and there are some things I'm going to have to potentially give up. Um, you know, with this film, we kind of, I think, we're very lucky in that we found a great partner at uh, Republic Pictures and this guy, Dan Cohen, who really, you know, given it's a six million dollar budget, it isn't so big. Um, that uh, there was really much input creatively. It was just like, you know, uh, who do you like? We, we said the, the actors we were hoping to get, he says, if you can get them, you've got, we'll cut the check. So this was sort of knock on wood, one of the, one of the great creative experiences I've had from, from you know, from, uh, from those early meetings on about the screenplay with, with Dan and Republic all the way through, you know, today and getting to premiere here. You've worked with so many of the best of the best as far as actors go. I feel bad asking this because there's so many options out there. Is there is there a bucket list collaborator, whether it's, you know, someone established that we really know or maybe someone newer that you've seen more recently that you say, like, that's a person I want to work with? Oh, that's a good question. Um, who would I really want to work with? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, man, I like... The, the, the guy who, you know, and again, I was very lucky, right? I was a young kid on the set of Private Ryan, got to work with Steven and was like a great, and still is a, like a mentor to me on my filmmaking side. You know, Tom Hanks was, you know, for all of us, 
again, and again, it was funny. He was only 40 when we made that film, you know, but he really was a mentor to everyone and, and led by example as to, you know, how you behave on set, how you show up to work prepared, how you treat your director, you know, your collaborator, but also how you treat PAs and everything. So I'd say that would be my, my dream would be able to work with Tom again because it was such a special experience. And I was a kid at the time. You know what I mean? It's really incredible how he's been such such a beacon for like everybody in every sector yeah. of this industry for so long. Yeah. Never wavers. Yeah. I have so much respect for him. So you do have something else coming up that I really wanted to ask about because I'm a big golf fan. Oh, Finnegan's really? Okay. Foursome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, how is that going? Are you able to tell me who you cast in those roles and if they had to be golfers? Uh, yeah, so the <laughs> so so it went great. We just came back from Ireland two weeks ago. Thank Yeah, it was really a special experience. Uh, it's the story of a um, an Irish American family whose father uh, was an Irish born golf professional, moved to the states in the in uh, in the fifties. He was a teaching pro, and uh, the family has an annual golf outing uh, called the Finnegans Foursome that they play every year. Uh, and uh, it is a comedy, but the patriarch, our golf pro, uh, has a heart attack on the tee box when his grandson hits a hole in one and everybody's celebrating. So they get his, his wishes to have his ashes brought back to Ireland to be distributed at the family farm where he grew up, the beach where he proposed to their mother, and his two favorite golf courses in Ireland. And he wants the, the, the tournament to continue on without him. So me and Brian Darcy James play the brothers. And Brian is in uh, Miller's as well. And I've worked with Brian a bunch of times. Um, and he is so funny in this movie. Um, and then uh, uh, his daughter is played by Erica Hernandez, who uh, was in my show, Bridge and Tunnel, who is a great actress, super funny. Uh, she has to see a scene where she has to sing The Parting Glass. She's got a great voice, but could not play golf. <laughs> So uh, she had to do uh, pretty extensive training. What we did with her was we got her a golf pro and was like, uh, she, don't let her hit a ball. Learn how to properly swing. And she had had some dance training. So we looked at it like if you're going to learn how to fight, you know, for a film, you would not get in the ring and actually make contact. You'd first lo learn proper movement. So we did that and her swing looks gorgeous. Uh, but uh, Brian Muller is an actor who's also in Bridge and Tunnel, plays my son, and he's about a six. So he's a legit golfer. Yeah. I assume you're a legit. I, I was wondering when I was reading, by the way, that's like a wild inciting incident. I like that quite right, a yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was wondering if it was going to lean more into the comedy of like the rest of the lineage not being as pro. As yeah, yeah. And we're not as pro. We're, we're like the, the, the whole thing is about like, Given that he was a golf pro and we, neither one of his sons had his swing, we have different uh, feelings about our father and how he felt about the fact that we weren't as good as he was. I'll end on one more question right. about this one. What is your personal greatest strength and weakness as a golfer? Uh, weakness is getting off the box. I just Fair like, enough. I can hit it far, but I just, I just, you know, and I don't have a consistent miss, right? So I, I can hook it, I can slice it. Um, I would say probably my short game is the best part of my game. Mm. And I put a lot of work into that. So and I like that. For yeah. that. As yeah. someone with the exact opposite set of skills, oh, really? I respect nice, that. Nice, nice. I'm going to say congratulations on that because you shot it. It's in the can. Yeah, I'm very yeah, much yeah. looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, and also congratulations on Miller's in Marriage. I cannot wait for it to wow Tiff and for you to get to celebrate it from here and well beyond. So huge congrats. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. To everybody out there, keep an eye out for Miller's and Marriage and stay tuned. More coming your way from the Collider interview studio at TIFF very, very soon. Mm -hmm.